Made up towns, a fictional battle, and a botched secret code. Saving Private Ryan might be a top-notch war movie, but when it comes to historical accuracy, it's further off than Private Ryan's post. Keep watching for the film's worst offenses. In any war movie, you can expect plenty of gunfire explosions and armored vehicles. While the weapons and vehicles that appear in Saving Private Ryan are true to history, director Steven Spielberg embellished some of the uses of these instruments for the film. For example, the film frequently ignores how hot weapon barrels become after prolonged periods of repetitive firing. During the D-Day invasion of the Allies, the soldiers firing MG-42s from Nazi gun nests experienced the consequences of this issue. Historically, the German army strictly forbade soldiers from firing the MG-42 for too long, instead preaching the importance of firing in shorter, controlled bursts to avoid overheating the barrels. If the machine guns were fired as relentlessly as we see in the film, the barrels would have grown so hot that they would have literally melted, rendering the guns useless. In a brief scene following the film's D-Day invasion, the U.S. Department of War is notified of the deaths of Private Ryan's three brothers. When the War Department colonel, played by Brian Cranston, learns that Mrs. Ryan will receive three telegrams with the news that her sons have been killed, you can spot a map of the world in the background. Looking closely, the map seems to be a Mercator projection. Maps of this style were popular at the time and featured images of some countries appearing slightly larger than actuality. During World War II, this specific sort of map was not used by the U.S. military, who instead relied on a map representing a very different layout of the world. Throughout World War II, artist Richard Eads Harrison's projection of the world was favored by the U.S. military. In his depiction of the globe, Harrison placed North America in the center of the map, splitting Eurasia into two. In doing so, Harrison wanted to convey that the entire war was centered around the United States. Unsurprisingly, this approach to cartography appealed to U.S. government and military personnel at the time. Saving Private Ryan accurately depicts all too real wartime atrocities committed by both sides, from Americans killing surrendering POWs to Nazis brutally killing wounded American soldiers. While the movie justly presents the Nazi military as cold-blooded and merciless, there are some details about the German army that the movie was not so accurate about. Foremost among these mistakes was the fact that many Nazi soldiers are shown to have shaved heads, such as the character of Steamboat Willie. While it might be common practice for soldiers to keep their hair short today, that was not the case for German soldiers at the time. Most Nazis favored a hairstyle known as the Prussian crew cut, which featured shorter buzzed sides with the hair on top of the head remaining long. Like most hairstyles, the origins of the undercut are difficult to trace, but it's likely rooted in World War I history. When military barbers had to quickly and uniformly cut dozens of soldiers' hair within a limited time span, simply shaving the back and sides saved time. This style haircut was popular in both Europe and America at the time, and could be seen displayed by civilians in post-World War I TV shows like Peaky Blinders and Boardwalk Empire. The haircuts of the German army were not the only aesthetic mistake made in Saving Private Ryan. The appearance of American paratroopers' uniforms also diverged from historical accuracy. In the film, paratroopers are seen wearing either brown or black jump boots as part of their uniform. Given the movie's setting in 1944, every paratrooper should be wearing brown jump boots, standard issue among troopers throughout that entire decade. Only later in the 1950s would black leather be used for paratrooper-issued boots. Additionally, nearly every paratrooper that appears in the film has a white spade mark on the side of their helmet. While it was common for military units to have the distinct insignia of their regiment on their helmets, the spade belonged to the 506th Infantry Regiment. Soldiers belonging to different regiments would have had different insignia markings on their helmets. For example, when Matt Damon first appears as Private Ryan, he stands alongside Corporal Henderson, a member of the 501st Infantry Regiment. 101st! We're coming out! Nevertheless, Henderson is wearing the white ace of the 506th, when in reality his helmet should have had the 501st traditional white diamond. During the final battle at Rommel, remaining American soldiers were miraculously saved by the arrival of the North American P-51 Mustang fighter plane. When the Mustang passes overhead, it has a distinct checkered pattern on its fuselage, indicating that the plane belongs to the 78th Fighter Group. While the 78th eventually flew P-51 Mustangs into battle, like most American Air Force units, they flew the more commonly used Republic P-47 Thunderbolts during the events of this film. The 78th officially made the conversion to P-51s in December 1944, nearly half a year after the D-Day invasion. They're tank busters, sir, P-51s. <laughs> Angels on our shoulders. Despite Private Ryan's observation, the P-51s were known for escorting heavy bombers on airborne missions, not combating German tanks. Additionally, the fighter is shown dropping heavy ordnance on the advancing Germans, even though it clearly lacks a bomb rack or any additional rockets attached to its wings or belly. At the end of the battle, the fighter is shown flying towards Miller and the Americans. Flying this direction would be against standard Air Force protocols. 
American fighters would never attack an enemy from behind, as that would mean dropping ordnance towards friendly units on the ground below, putting them at significant risk. Instead, the planes would have flown either from behind the American forces or perpendicular to the bridge. Unsurprisingly, the opening sequence of Saving Private Ryan focuses nearly entirely on American forces playing an extensive role in the invasion of Normandy. While it is true that the U.S. military played a vital role in capturing Omaha and Utah Beach, the film does not show the other Allied forces who assisted in those D-Day beach landings. Notably missing is the appearance of British military forces, who had an active role in helping the Americans secure the Nazi-occupied beaches. If you're talking about 1,200 warships, over 4,000 landing craft, 12,000 aircraft. In the opening moments of the battle, American soldiers are transported to the beachhead via landing crafts known as LCVPs, or Higgins boats. LCVPs were used by the U.S. Maltese and French navies from 1942 to 1945. They were indeed used during the beach landings at Normandy, but only in subsequent assault waves. In the first wave, the one Captain Miller and his company are shown landing in, British landing craft assault vehicles, also known as LCAs, were used due to their heavier bodies and added protection. The British ferried American forces from offshore naval vessels to the beaches, with the Royal Navy contributing multiple transport ships to the assault. While Saving Private Ryan does a great job portraying the horrors of the D-Day invasion, one of the dangers it depicts wasn't nearly as much of a threat as the film would lead you to believe. Shortly after the U.S. Rangers launched their first wave of assault on the Nazi-occupied beach, many men could be seen in the water. Fatigued from seasickness and weighted down by their equipment, many real soldiers were unable to reach the surface and sadly drowned. The idea of a bullet piercing through the water and killing men below the surface, as depicted in the film, is a common trick used in movies. In real life, when a rifle-caliber bullet is shot at a body of water, it loses all lethal momentum and will sink harmlessly after its initial impact with the water's surface. Even high-caliber bullets like the ones used by the Nazis at D-Day are not exempt from this physical law. According to Science ABC, the faster the bullet is traveling, the slower it will go underwater. The opening scene of Saving Private Ryan blew viewers away in 1998 and still does today. It drops viewers into the middle of terrifying, unending chaos and death as soldiers scramble for their lives while being showered by bullets, blood, and bodies. Shown in lengthy graphic detail, Spielberg makes the viewer uncomfortable while illustrating the extreme acts of heroism and bravery displayed by the Allies in the face of such overwhelming defenses. As brutal as the scene is, the real-life Omaha Beach landings were even worse. For starters, the beach the American forces land on in the film is fairly small. In reality, there was a 200-yard distance between the shoreline and the German defenses. In the film, Captain Miller and his company arrive as part of the first wave of American forces on Omaha Beach, almost immediately pushing their way up the beach toward the German lines. In reality, the Allies weren't able to advance up that beach until the third landing group arrived, with the assault taking hours to complete. Of course, for the sake of brevity, it's understandable why Spielberg had to cut the landing down. The resulting 30 minutes still offers a lengthy, largely accurate depiction of D-Day. When deliberating on whether to send someone to find Private Ryan and withdraw him from active service, General George C. Marshall, played by Harv Presnell, recites a letter from Abraham Lincoln. The letter is written to a woman named Mrs. Bixby and informs her that all five of her sons have died in battle. Emboldened by Lincoln's words, Marshall decides to send Miller and the remnants of his company to find Ryan and bring him home. The boy's alive. We are going to send somebody to find him. Despite Lincoln's letter being real, its contents were far from the truth. According to The Atlantic, President Lincoln had been fed false information when he wrote the letter. Only two of Bixby's sons had been killed in the Civil War. Of the remaining three, one was captured by the Confederates and later traded back to the U.S. Army in a prisoner exchange. The final two eventually deserted the Union Army. While the letter itself may be moving, its publication also stirred a lot of controversy when it was originally sent. The contents of the letter were publicized in the media, and many of Lincoln's opponents viewed it as a shallow attempt to appear sympathetic to families who had lost loved ones to the Civil War, rather than the gripping condolence recited by Marshall. Several times in Saving Private Ryan, American soldiers are heard using a secret code to identify comrades in the field. Thunder! Flash! This was an authentic call sign used by the U.S. military during the D-Day invasion. However, the order in which it is said was reversed in the film. In actuality, the challenge sign was issued by a soldier saying Flash, and the all-clear sign of a friendly ally was indicated with Thunder. This may seem like a minor mistake at first, but its basis in historical fact is an interesting one. The th sound made by the letters T and H does not exist in the German language. For this reason, even if a German soldier knew the correct response, he would have a difficult time saying thunder without exposing his accent. 
Additionally, the codes and responses used by the Allies changed on a daily basis. Soldiers were expected to memorize both the code and designated response phrase, as well as which day specific codes were scheduled to be used. While the first act of Saving Private Ryan is largely rooted in fact, the remainder of the film takes on a far more dramatized presentation of World War II history. In particular, both the town of Rommel and the epic battle that occurs there are completely fictional. In the film, we learn that Ryan and his fellow paratroopers had received orders to secure the bridges along the Mertere River. While this was indeed a historical objective of the U.S. military following the Normandy invasion, the task was assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division under Operation Boston. Ryan belonged to the 101st Airborne Division and would have had a different mission. Similarly, while the Nazi division whom the protagonists battle at the end of the movie, the 2nd SS Panzer Division Das Reich, was an actual elite unit, their appearance in the film runs contrary to their actual combat records. Before D-Day, Das Reich held a strategic position in southern France to quickly combat an invasion force on either French coast. When the Allies landed, Das Reich attempted to move by train towards Normandy, only to find the railways already sabotaged by French freedom fighters. The division was forced to march north by foot, taking weeks to finally reach Normandy. When they did arrive, they ended up battling British and Canadian forces at Caen in mid-July, not the American forces as shown in Saving Private Ryan. As unbelievable as it may seem, the plot of Saving Private Ryan was based on an actual incident that took place in World War II. During the naval battle of Guadalcanal, the USS Juno was sunk by Japanese torpedoes, killing nearly 700 men. Five of these men were the Sullivan brothers who were on board. This tragedy was dramatized in the 1944 film The Fighting Sullivans. After the news of the brothers' deaths was publicized in the U.S., the military introduced the sole survivor policy, exempting the sole surviving member of a family from military service if all their siblings had died in the line of duty in 1948. However, not officially a law at the time, the policy was cited as the reason why U.S. paratrooper Fritz Nyland was ordered home in the middle of the Normandy invasion. Nyland, the inspiration for Private Ryan, had three brothers who were all reported KIA. This tragedy resulted in Nyland being ordered away from the front. He was stationed in England and later shipped back to the United States for the remainder of his time in the service. Similar to Ryan, Nyland initially refused to leave, though was ultimately forced to follow his superior's orders. Incredibly, Fritz's older brother Edward had in fact survived his crash in Burma. After being liberated from a Japanese POW camp, Edward joined Fritz in the U.S., reuniting the family. Edward got it wrong because my dad did come home. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.